today. COVID-19 pandemic is still ongoing all around the world, but we are still caring for non-COVID patients. And today we will talk about headaches, a very common complaint in internal medicine practice. My name is Oğuz Abdullah Uyaroğlu, and I'm the young internist representative of Turkey. I'm an internist in general medicine department at Hacettepe University in Ankara. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Ben Lovell. Today, he will talk us about managing headaches in acute medicine. He's an associate professor of medical education and a consultant in acute internal medicine at University College London Hospitals. Now I invite my friend and colleague, Paul, the young internist representative of Iceland to take over and he will give us the details of this interactive webinar and we'll start the presentation. Paul, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Okus. Uh, as I, I would like to use this opportunity to point out our website of our organization, uh, efim.org, and also the Facebook site, uh, Young Internist of Europe. Uh, feel free to join the sites and you, where you can follow our activity. Uh, as for the webinar, Today, you can share the link and passcode with everyone that would like to join or point people to the Facebook site and they can find it there. Uh, the webinar will also be available there after this presentation. Uh, regarding today's lecture, we will let Ben give his presentation without interruption and ask questions in the end. I would uh, like to ask you to turn off your microphones for the session and ask questions through, through the chat to avoid echo and unnecessary noise. After the lecture, we will read the questions out loud for Ben to answer. And then without further delay, I will let Ben take over and give his presentation, clinical approach and management of patients with headache within acute internal and emergency medicine. Ben, go ahead. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody, welcome. Uh, I'm going to be talking about headaches because in my experience as a doctor and as a teacher of doctors, uh, I find that doctors in training, internists and junior doctors in training, find headaches quite tricky. So I'm hopefully going to demystify headaches for you. And when I'm talking about headaches today, I'm talking about patients with headaches who have made their way into hospital and you are meeting for the first time, maybe in the emergency department or maybe they've been admitted to your ward. And I'm going to go through a good systematic way of uh, assessing somebody who has a headache. So let's start off with some basic headache stats. And this was taken from a paper looking at people who'd come to the emergency department with a headache. Uh, and they found that 31% of them came in an ambulance. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today when you're treating somebody with an acute headache is de-escalation. And by de-escalation, it means trying to give the message to the patient in your body language and what you say that they will not need to stay in hospital. Most headaches get worse in hospital um, and people with headaches rarely need to be admitted. And sometimes that can be tricky to negotiate with the patient. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to frame the problem for the patient as it being an outpatient problem. But patients, when they come in, they can come in with an ambulance with a headache and it's quite difficult sometimes to de-escalate that problem. Um, the, average, the median age of someone uh, coming to a &E with a headache is quite young, about 39. And people who come to a &E with a headache with an instant peak, this is your thunderclap headache. So they were fine, then all of a sudden, boom, they have a severe headache, it's about 18%. And thunderclap headaches, sudden onset headaches, these are something that can cause a lot of anxiety in internal medicine. So I'm going to be focusing on that at the beginning of this talk. People who come in and say their headache maximum intensity came on within one hour. So they went from no pain to being in the worst pain within a one hour. So not a true thunderclap headache, sudden onset headache that we see with the subarachnoid hemorrhages, but a rather rapid onset. It's about half of them. And the worst ever headache, how, what do you reckon is the percentage of people coming into a &E with their worst ever headache? It's actually about 37%. What does this mean? It means that some 37% of patients uh, are coming in because they're frightened. It's the worst headache they ever had. And the rest of them have had worse headaches than this before in the past, yet still they came into the emergency department. Why? Because they often are people with chronic headache disorder 
who have simply reached the limit of what they are able to cope with at home. And how, what percentage of people, when you say, how severe is the pain uh, out of 10? What percentage of people say 10 out of 10? Most people guess 100%, but actually 23%. So as I said, a lot of people who come into the emergency department with headache have actually, it's not the most severe headache they ever had, but often they simply cannot cope anymore. A few more. How many, uh, what percentage of people who come into any with a headache are, are drowsy, have a diminished conscious level, have a GCS less than uh, 15? The more frightening headaches, only 4%. How, what percentage of them have neck stiffness, have meningism? About 4.8%. And how many of, what percentage get a CT head? I don't know about your institution, but we do a lot of CT heads for headaches at mine. About 38% of people get a scan. And what percentage get a lumbar puncture for CSF analysis? 4.7. These are UK statistics. So there is a real problem with knowing what tests to use for patients uh, and looking at each test, such as a lumbar puncture, and deciding whether the risks weigh out the benefits. So let's think about how to assess a patient who's come in with a severe headache as an emergency case to your hospital. Four-step approach. Number one. First of all, look for the serious secondary headaches. I will tell you what the serious secondary headaches are. If you do not find a serious secondary headache, then assess for the patient for a non-serious secondary headache. And the reason we do that before number three is because you cannot assess for a primary headache disorder. By primary headache disorder, I mean tension type headache or migraine. You cannot say they've got that until you've ruled out a secondary headache first. So we look for the non-serious secondary causes. And then if we do not find a serious secondary cause, a non-serious secondary cause, or a primary headache, who is drawing that? <laughs> then we look for a, a less common cause of headache. I'm just going to pause for a second. So as I was saying, you must exclude a secondary cause for a headache before you diagnose primary headache disorder. So let's start off at point number one. I said the first thing you're going to do is look for a serious secondary cause. Serious secondary causes, first of all, do they have something growing in their head? Do they have a SOL, a space occupying lesion? And usually with these people, you will see features in their history of raised intracranial pressure, which you know about. These are people who say they've got a headache, which is worse in the morning. The headache onset has been a kind of insidiously worsening headache over a period of many weeks. They find the headache makes them very nauseated and they vomit a lot. They find the headache is worse when they're lying down or when they're coughing or sneezing or otherwise raising their intracranial pressure. Often these patients will have metastasis. So you should always think about, do they have a primary cancer elsewhere? For example, if someone has a primary malignancy of the breast and they were complaining of a serious secondary headache, a headache which is worse in the morning, had features of space occupying lesion, then I would be doing a CT scan because I'd be worried about something uh, metastasizing to the brain. You can also have um, a sort of a pseudo space occupying lesion, and these are people who've got raised intracranial pressure, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This used to be called benign intracranial hypertension. Uh, but we don't call it benign intracranial hypertension anymore because it is not benign. A lot of these people end up having neurosurgery. So we call it idiopathic. And these are classically young women who have a high BMI uh, and they have features of raised intracranial pressure. All of those symptoms I described. And perhaps when you look at the back of their eyes, you see papilledema. Another serious secondary cause is bleeding in the brain. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, some, either they've hit their head, they've been a victim of trauma, or they've had a thunderclap headache and you're worried about a uh, subarachnoid um, hemorrhage. And a subarachnoid hemorrhage, as you know, is when a small arterial vessel pops, blood floods into the brain, and they get a sudden onset headache. And these patients are usually very ill. Um, I'd be worried if they had dropped their GCS and they were drowsy, and if the headache onset was true thunderclap in nature. Another serious secondary cause, GCA, giant cell arteritis, only really if they're over 50 years old, temporal arteritis, and I'll talk about that in a bit, 
and infection, so meningitis. So I'm looking for people who have fever or meningism, photophobia, a stiff neck. And looking at how the pain levels change in people with these different uh, disorders, if someone's got a mass lesion, a space occupying lesion, they will say the headache is slowly getting worse over a period of days. And if you look at the pain level for someone who's had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, there will be absolutely no pain. And then like that, they will suddenly be in severe agony. And the pain usually abates a little bit, but does not go away. So let's talk a bit about thunderclap headaches. Thunderclap headache is the phrase we use for a sudden onset headache. And the patient classically says, I was completely pain free. I had no pain at all. I was going about my normal life. Then all of a sudden, I was in agony. And I thought someone had hit me on the back of the head. It was that sudden and that intense. And a thunderclap headache is thought to be, well, it is a hallmark of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. However, in, when you actually take a careful history from a patient who's been sent to you, with a thunderclap headache, you'll probably find that about 50% of them are not true thunderclap headaches. So ask them what they were doing when it started. In a thunderclap headache, they will actually be fine doing something like cleaning, driving, talking at work. They will know exactly what they were doing the second their headache came on. But in half cases, when you say, what were you doing specifically? And they say, well, I was working. And you say, what were you doing at work at the moment it started? They say, well, it was a whole morning, really. And then you find out that actually their thunderclap headache came on over a couple of hours. And to a patient, that is a sudden onset headache, but it's not a true thunderclap headache, which is in keeping with an arterial bleed within the brain. So a careful history is the first thing just for separating out people who don't really have a thunderclap headache. And you do not need to keep investigating for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now we know only 66% sorry, of thunderclap headaches are actually due to subarachnoid hemorrhage. 94% of sudden onset thunderclap headaches are due to either migraine, um, a venous sinus thrombosis, or a tension headache disorder, which comes on suddenly. So even if the patient has a really good history for a thunderclap headache, and you're wondering whether they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the likelihood is that they don't. Only 6% of people with a good story actually do. However, counterbalanced against that, we know that 12% of subarachnoid hemorrhages patients are missed on their first presentation. So we need to balance these two risks side by side because the test for subarachnoid hemorrhage traditionally is the lumbar puncture, examining the cerebrospinal fluid for xanthochromia, doing that lumbar puncture 12 hours after the onset of the headache. Now, lumbar puncture is not a benign investigation. I have seen all sorts of complications, the commonest one being a post-lumbar puncture headache, so really excruciating headache pain after a lumbar puncture due to low pressure. But I've also seen people develop paraspinal um, uh, collections of blood, um, nerve damage, um, infection, and it hurts. Having a lumbar puncture is painful and frightening for a patient, so it's not something we would do easily. So personally, in my experience, I feel that maybe a lot too many lumbar punctures are done for people with headaches in internal medicine. And there should be a way of making a more informed decision before going down that road. And one decision making um, a bit of help that I use is the Ottawa, Ottawa rule. And the Ottawa rule was from a paper published in JAMA in 2013, uh, where they examined over 2,000, 2,300 odd patients who had a good thunderclap headache, sudden onset headache, and they examined how good a CT scan is at diagnosing or ruling out a subarachnoid hemorrhage without doing an LP. The Ottawa rule was found to be very specific and very sensitive for these following criteria. So if you have a patient who is young, under 40, and they don't have any neck pain or stiffness, they didn't lose consciousness, it wasn't during exertion, it didn't come on over seconds, it came on over an hour, and they don't have neck stiffness when you try and move their head, they are Ottawa negative. And they said, according to their study, with over 2,300 patients, it has a sensitivity of 100% of ruling out, lumbar, uh, ruling out the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is something that I use in my practice. If I've got someone who had a sudden onset headache, I have look at these uh, six criteria, and if the patient is not positive for any one of these criteria, I'm pretty certain that they have not had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, 
and I do not need to move forward to doing a lumbar puncture for these patients. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's something that I do use to help my decision-making process if I'm not sure. So the Ottawa rule is very, very useful for patients under the age of 40 who don't have any of these criteria. If you can't use the Ottawa rule, if they score a point someone, you can't use it as a rule out, uh, you can move on to uh, the six hour CT, which I'll tell you about. But the implication of the Ottawa rule, if they are negative, you do not need to keep looking for a subarachnoid hemorrhage with a lumbar puncture if you feel that if you feel that's safe. If they screen positive, they may have a subarachnoid hemorrhage and further tests may be implicated. So let's say that we try to use the Ottawa rule and it did not help us. Do we definitely have to do the lumbar puncture? Well, not necessarily. Think about their CT. Most people who come in with a severe headache get a CT scan. If you get the CT done, could it diagnose a subarachnoid hemorrhage and then you don't have to do the lumbar puncture? Well, here's the data. This was published in the BMJ in 2011. They looked at about 3,000 patients and they found that if you don't have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, your CT won't be falsely positive, which is great. And a CT can pick up most cases of a subarachnoid bleed on its own. However, they found there were some cases out of 3,000 people here, there were 17 patients who had a normal CT scan, who, but did have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which was diagnosed on a subsequent LP. And they found that the CT scan sensitivity for subarachnoid was pretty good. It was 92.9%. But most people would agree, we're talking about something that could potentially kill or seriously disable a patient. And a sensitivity of 93% is not quite good enough. But then they looked at when you get the CT. If you have the CT scan more than six hours after your headache starts, the CT becomes less useful. The sensitivity drops to 85.7%. It doesn't really become a diagnostic tool. But if you get your CT scan within six hours of, your, of the headache starting, the sensitivity goes up to 100%. A CT scan within six hours of a thundercup headache is almost the perfect tool for ruling out a subarachnoid hemorrhage without going forward to a lumbar puncture in this uh, case series, in this study. So again, I find this a really useful test. If I'm not certain whether I want to do a lumbar puncture on someone, I look at the timing. What time did your headache start? What time did they get their CT? If it's within six hours, then I know that this study um, showed that they almost definitely do not have any bleeding and the patient can be safely discharged. Again, you've got to use a little bit of your own clinical experience and your gut feeling with this, but it is a useful decision aid when you're trying to reach um, a clinical decision, the six hour CT rule. So that's thunderclap headaches. The other serious secondary headache I wanted to mention was giant cell arteritis. Um, and it's a very, very rare disease affecting 0.02% of people over the age of 50. And these people tend to be in their 70s and they tend to be women. And when I'm running the emergency clinic in acute medicine, I get a lot of phone calls from GPs in the community saying, I have a patient, they're 35 and they've got a severe unilateral headache and I'm worried that it could be a uh, temporal arteritis. Um, and I know for a fact it won't be because that is excruciatingly rare. I'll show you the data in a second. We use the ESR, the erythrite sedimentation rate, to diagnose or to help us diagnose giant cell arteritis. But just remember that 4% of people with giant cell arteritis, temporal arteritis, will have a normal ESR. And your ESR can be normalized if you are taking statins, if you are taking anti inflammatories like um, ibuprofen or non steroidals, or if you're taking disease modifying drugs such as methotrexate or sulfasalazine, you can have a falsely normal ESR. Temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis, under the age of 50, it almost does not happen. We can see here in this paper, it is a rare entity with fewer than 20 reported cases in the history of medicine. So therefore, if I do get a phone call about, or I get a referral for a patient under the age of 50 with a unilateral headache, I can reassure the referring doctor pretty quickly that this is not going to be temporal arteritis. So to make a diagnosis, of temporal arteritis. What I always use is the American College of Rheumatology Diagnostic Criteria. And they say 
you've got to have three out of the following. You've got to be over 50. It's got to be a new headache. The temporal artery has to be painful when you press it and you have loss of pulsation. So if you're feeling the patient's temporal artery and it's really throbbing, pulsing quite hard, that's not in keeping with temporal arteritis. And temporal arteritis, the artery thickens and you can't feel the pulse in it. An ESR of more than 50 or an abnormal biopsy. So you've taken a biopsy of temporal artery and you've diagnosed giant cell arteritis under the microscope. If you have three out of those five, then you can make a diagnosis of uh, temporal arteritis with a sensitivity of 94%. And notice that it's possible to make the diagnosis even if you've got a normal biopsy, because the way that temporal arteritis affects the temporal artery is it skips areas. So if you happen to biopsy a normal area, you'll get a falsely normal biopsy result. So what are you gonna do if you've got a patient who you think has temporal arteritis, has giant cell arteritis? The official guidelines state in the American College is to shoot first and ask questions later. And what they mean is start steroids right there and then with the patient in front of you because they could have a stroke or lose their eyesight. Um, and don't worry about giving somebody steroids and then making a falsely normal biopsy because a biopsy will remain abnormal if they have temporal arteritis up to seven days after you've started steroid treatment. And seven days is usually enough to arrange urgent biopsy. So start them on treatment. What treatment are you going to give them? We're going to give them steroids to suppress the inflammation. But we're going to give them another couple of things as well. If they have uncomplicated temporal arteritis, i.e. they have no visual loss in the same eye and they do not have jaw claudication, that pain when they're chewing, you can start them on 40 milligrams of prednisolone. If they've got visual loss or jaw claudication, the dose has to be increased to 60 milligrams of pred. And we should start them on aspirin as well. And the reason we're starting someone on aspirin as well is because they're at risk of having a, a stroke and aspirin reduces the risk of ischemic stroke or ischemic arteritis. And then we refer them for an urgent biopsy. Now it doesn't specifically say this in the guidelines, but considering that the average temporal arteritis patient is a woman in her 70s, and we're going to start them on both prednisolone and aspirin, I always start them on a proton pump inhibitor such as lansoprazole at the same time for gastro protection. So I've talked about the serious secondary headaches. If you can't find a serious secondary cause for the headache, have a think about whether they have any non serious secondary causes. And the common non-serious secondary headaches that I see out of this selection in front of you here is medication overuse headache, sinusitis, and TMJ dysfunction. Sinusitis, the patient is in pain when you press on their sinuses here. That sinusitis can mimic a new space occupying lesion. They'll say they're getting a slowly worsening headache of many, many days, uh, and it can mimic the features of raised intracranial pressure. So often they get the diagnosis of sinusitis when you do the CT head looking for a brain tumor or something, and instead you find their sinuses are completely packed. TMJ dysfunction is a very, very common. People who grind their teeth, you can usually diagnose it by placing your hand over the patient's temporomandibular joint here and asking them to chew, or open and close their mouth, and you'll feel the TMJ cracking and clicking bilaterally. And they tend to have very tender temporalis muscles. But medication overuse headache is trickier, and we see it quite a lot in uh, acute medicine, in ambulatory care medicine. To have the, a diagnosis of medication overuse headache, or MOH, you have to have a pre-existing primary headache disorder, which you're taking painkillers for. Interestingly, you don't get, no one gets medication over his headache if they take lots of painkillers for arthritis of the knee or uh, postoperatively or a bad hip. You have to be taking analgesia for a headache disorder to get medication over his headache. You've got to have pain for 15 days out of one month and it's got to last for more than three months and you've got to be taking regular analgesia. And this is analgesia more than three times a week or on two consecutive days of any week. And it is very, very common and it is very, very problematic to treat, as many of you may know. And the pain levels, the severity of pain with medication overuse headache is they'll have bad pain. They'll increase their dose of analgesia and the pain will improve. It will never go back down to the baseline. Then they'll have another bad day. They'll take more analgesia and it will improve slightly. 
and they'll keep doing that until eventually they're in constant headache uh, situation. The treatment of medication overuse headache is really tricky. You have to teach the patient about what the disease is and how it's being driven and triggered by taking analgesia. And this, sometimes this can be very hard for patients to accept. You have to detoxify them. They have to stop taking painkillers and they have to stop suddenly, cold turkey, which most patients find a horrific prospect if you say you need to stop taking painkillers now and they're in intense pain. And then the headache gets worse for about 48 hours and then it starts to improve and the patient has to push through that. And think about treating the primary headache disorder, which they were taking analgesia for in the first place. How did they get into such a bad situation? Maybe they've got migraines and they don't have any triptan, so they've been taking paracetamol or something instead. Now, we know from studies that there was a Norwegian study which looked at patients who underwent the education, detoxification and primary treatment, um, primary headache treatment. And they found that it's between 50 to 70% effective at curing medication overuse headache at 18 months. So it is a long, long time for the patients to be going through this uh, until they find their pain free again. And therefore relapse is common. A patient will do really well and not taking their aspirin or their ibuprofen until they have one bad day and they'll just take one and they'll find it really works. And the next thing they're, you know, they're back to taking medication every single day for their headache. Very tricky to treat. The worst medication for medication overuse headache is anything with opioids in it. Tramadol, codeine, dihydrocodeine, oxycontin, anything like this, oxycodone. Um, it, uh, opiates are an absolute nightmare for causing medication overuse headache. And in fact, there isn't really any cause for giving opioids to patients with headache at all. And I'll keep coming back to this point. Opioids are very, very bad drugs to give anyone with any headache disorder. So moving on to uh, the primary headaches now. So if you've done the, the serious and the non-serious secondaries, does this patient have a primary headache disorder? And by primary headache disorder, I mean tension type headaches and migraine. Migraine is a recurring severe headache disorder, which can be quite disabling. To have the criteria according to the International Classification of Headache Disorders, you've got to have a headache which lasts between four and 72 hours but most of migraine attacks last for one day on average. It's gonna have two out of the following features. It's gonna be unilateral. The word migraine itself comes from Greek, hemicrania, half your head. It's a unilateral headache. It's gonna be pulsing. It's gotta be moderate to severe, and it's aggravated by physical activity. So even walking from around the house can make the headache much worse. So in my experience, we don't often find acute migraine disorder in the A&E department in the hospital because they simply cannot leave the house. The pain is so bad. Um, and it's two out of those features and one out of these features, nausea and vomiting or photophobia or phonophobia. They can't bear light, they can't bear sound. So your classical migraine patient is in dark room with all the lights off in silence with a severe unilateral headache which lasts for about a day. And the natural time course for migraines follows a certain pattern. Now, according to the ICHD, they say to get a diagnosis of migraine disorder, you have to have five attacks of these headaches to be diagnosed as a migraine, which I think is pretty harsh. But there is a way of making a pretty good go at make the diagnosis just for meeting the patient one time. And that's by using the pound criteria. And this is what I use if I think a patient has a migraine and I don't plan on seeing them for the next five times they have it to clinch the diagnosis. So the pound criteria is an acronym, P-O-U-N-D. It stands for pulsatile, it's gotta be a pulsing headache, one day duration, unilateral, with nausea and vomiting, and disabling levels of pain. And according to this study published in Migraine Annuals International, if you have four or five features, uh, criteria from the pound criteria, the diagnosis of it being migraine is about 92%. So it's a really good way of making a diagnosis having just met the patient one time. So let's quickly talk about the natural course of a migraine headache. First of all, the patient often gets a prodrome the day leading up to a migraine where they know they're going to have one. About 60% of people get it. 
And this is usually manifested in uh, feeling irritable, feeling tired, feeling weak, having low energy, sometimes having pain in the body, sometimes having a bit of constipation or diarrhea. Then about one third of migraine sufferers will move into the aura phase of the migraine, which is very short. It usually lasts about 40 minutes. And this is where they will commonly see visual aura. So twinkling lights in the distance, um, jag zagged lines, zigzags, cross hatching lines, sometimes in the center, sometimes in the periphery of their vision. And there is no pain at this point until the aura phase completes and they enter the pain phase. And the pain phase can la usually last about a day. And this is when the patient is very disabled with pain. And they're very nauseated, they vomit, they can't stand the light, they can't stand the sound. And then they have the post drove where they feel very washed out and unwell and fatigued. And then the migraine has finished its course. So sometimes we see patients in the pain phase of migraine. We know that people with migraine disorders sometimes get stigmatized as having low pain thresholds, but it isn't true. We know that people who suffer from migraines actually have higher pain thresholds than control people. And this was established in studies where they inflicted pain, such as ice and electric shocks on people with and without migraines. And they found people with migraine are able to tolerate higher levels of unpleasant pain. And this is probably due to some level of central desensitization to the pain process over a period of time. So if you see someone who has an acute migraine, you think they're in the pain phase of a migraine, we need to get them as pain-free as we can and get them home. Migraines do not get better in hospital. Hospitals are noisy. They're loud. They have bright lights. They have nurses coming and doing blood pressure. They have blood tests, blood tests. Migraines do not get better in the hospital. So we need to get them comfortable enough to go home. And if you're treating someone with a migraine or even treating yourself, you need to get in early when the pain is still mild. Ideally, treat them in the pre-drome or in the aura phase before they get in the pain phase. Once you're in the pain phase, it's harder to abolish the migraine. And we have to think about using good doses of drugs and using the right routes of administration. People in the pain phase of migraine often have temporary gastroparesis. They do not absorb oral medication and also they vomit. So if you are going to give oral medication for someone having an acute migraine attack, it should be co-administered with a prokinetic such as metoclopramide to facilitate absorption of the drug. And we have to be very, very careful with migraine to help that patient avoid developing medication overuse headache, which would be a very, very difficult thing for someone who already has a primary headache disorder such as migraine to develop a secondary headache, medication overuse headache on top of that. It can completely impact their, their entire quality of life. So we have to avoid that. And that usually means by avoiding any opiates. I'll keep coming back to it. NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK says opioids are not recommended because they will exacerbate nausea and they increase the risk of medication overuse headache. BASH, which is the British Association for the Study of Headaches, say that narcotics, opioids, are not recommended for the emergency treatment of migraine and their use can actually be associated with delayed recovery. Now, and here is the uh, seminal paper published in Headache. Opioids should not be used in migraine. Opioids are pronociceptive. Opioids prevent the reversal of the migraine central sensitization. They don't get that better pain threshold. They interfere with tryptans. They uh, precipitate bad clinical outcomes, especially transformation to daily headache. Uh, opioids are not recommended. Now, this is easy for us to say, but if a patient does have migraines and they find that one dose of an opioid gets rid of their migraine, it's very difficult for us to deny them that. But if you're meeting someone for the first time with an acute migraine, I would not offer them opioids as a first line treatment. We have other options, which I'll tell you about now. This is hard because this in the UK is the over the counter medication that is branded for migraine relief, which you can buy without a prescription. And you can see it contains codeine, uh, which is an opioid. And it says can cause addiction for three days use only, doesn't mention medication overuse headache. And people who have migraines will take this medication not knowing that by taking codeine and opiate, they're actually precipitating worse clinical outcomes for yourself, for themselves. So what can we give them instead? We've got some options, paracetamol. It's okay, 
A gram of paracetamol, the number needed to treat to get one migraine sufferer pain-free is 12. So it does have a role and it has no harm. So, migra uh, so uh, paracetamol one gram is something you can give first line. NSAIDs, you have different options. Aspirin, ibuprofen, diclofenac or naproxen. The number needed to treat to get one patient pain-free is eight for 900 milligrams of aspirin. It's a lot of aspirin. If you're counting it out in 75 milligram tablets, it looks quite frightening to the patient. Ibuprofen, you've got to get a number needed to treat is eight, diclofenac seven, naproxen is, is 11. So I usually pick one of these, paracetamol plus an NSAID such as aspirin 900. What about giving the patient intravenous fluids? I'm not a big fan of giving intravenous medication in migraine because as I said at the beginning, a lot of treating migraine, apart from getting the pain improved, is reassuring the patient and managing their expectations and trying to de-escalate. If a patient has been brought in by ambulance, immediately they've been changed into a hospital gown, they're in a dark room, they've got a cannula in here, they've got a blood pressure cuff here, they've got ECG electrodes here, it's quite difficult then for the internist to de-escalate this. Okay, electrodes off, blood pressure cuff out, cannula out, you can sit out in the bed, we need to get you comfortable enough to get home or you will not get better. So giving someone intravenous fluid goes against that de-escalation policy. And there's mixed evidence that it's useful. Theoretically, it could work. We know that dehydration could trigger a migraine in someone. We know that people with migraine are very nauseated and vomiting and they won't be drinking many fluids. But there's no real evidence that a litre of normal saline, for example, will help abort the acute migraine attack. So there are non-specific treatments. The specific treatment for migraine, which actually targets the migraine, is triptans. Triptans are very effective, very selective 5-HT1 um, agonists, and they work both peripherally and centrally at the trigeminal nerve. And uh, we can give them orally, or we can use other routes, such as um, uh, nasally or subcutaneously. And we know that they're, fit, they're effective in about 60% of people who don't get any better with the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Sometimes patients will not like triptans. They don't like the side effects. These are called the triptan sensations, which is usually flushing of the face, paresthesia of the peripheries, and sometimes a bit of pressure on the chest. And that's because uh, triptans are very powerful vasoconstrictors. We don't give triptans to people who, with uncontrolled hypertension, with coronary artery disease, or with Raynaud's disease, could you could precipitate a vaso-occlusive crisis because they're powerful vasoconstrictors. Uh, triptans are licensed for use in pregnancy. There was a theoretical risk they would cause constriction across the placental flow, but actually now they've uh, been found to be safe. So in the UK, I advise people, if they're going to buy a tablet over the counter without prescription, they should get Migrelief Ultra, which contains sumatriptan, rather than the ordinary Migrelief, which contains codeine. Long-term treatment for migraine, a lot of it is about education. Patients, after a while, learn what triggers a migraine and how to avoid it. Often it's food, um, change in shift patterns at work, or change in their sleep patterns. So I always direct the patient towards some kind of resource which will help them manage their own migraines. Um, because patient education and patients taking control of chronic conditions always have better outcomes, in my experience. If you wanted to give someone medication, uh, because maybe they've tried some lifestyle changes. Uh, you have some options to prevent recurrence of migraine disorder. And I sometimes give this to patients who find that they get a monthly migraine, maybe uh, associated with menstruation, for example, and they're missing a whole week of work uh, every month because of migraine disorder. First line is propranolol, which is usually given and tolerated quite well without too many side effects. Second line is to pyramate, which is an anti-epileptic. And um, if you're giving patients to pyramate, we need to start talking about birth control because it is teratogenic. So the patient cannot get pregnant if you're going to start to pyramate. Amitriptyline has got some good evidence behind it if taken at night. And a newer drug for preventing recurrence is candesartan, which, as you know, is an angiotensin receptor blocker, uh, which is actually uh, now licensed in the UK. For, uh, for primary uh, migraine disorder. Uh, 
Moving on to the other primary headache disorder, and this probably forms the main bulk of headaches that I see in my daily practice in internal medicine, that is tension type headache. It's called tension type headache because the sensation feels like tension on the head, not because it's related to tension or stress in your life, which can be confusing for patients, and you'll need to clarify that. Because if you tell a patient they have a tension headache, they will say, but I'm not tense, I'm not stressed, I'm relaxed. It's tension describes the feeling of tension on the head. And these headaches are a bit different to migraine. They last much longer. They can last for many days in a row. And instead of being that unilateral pain of a migraine, it's a bilateral pain. So patients often say there's something tight sensation around their head. It's very pressing, very tightening. The patient uses language of tightening, constriction, pressure, and it's mild to moderate severity. Remember I told you that migraine is, I'm gonna do questions at the end. Someone's raised their hand, but if you wanna write a question in the chat box, we'll cover them at the end. If someone uh, with a migraine has moderate to severe pain, intention type headache, although to the patient, it feels very severe compared with migraine, it is actually mild to moderate. And it's usually not aggravated by activity. So the patient is able to walk around. And that's why we see these patients in the emergency department and in hospital, because they're able to make the journey. It should not cause nausea and vomiting. If your patient with tension type headache is being sick or feels very nauseated, I would reconsider the diagnosis. But they may have the photophobia. They may be sitting in your waiting department with the dark glasses on. They may not like loud noises. And here's the pain side by side. So when you have a migraine, very severe pain. Tension, it's more mild to, to moderate the pain levels. Now, treating tension type headache can be tricky. Paracetamol, due to, in this huge uh, Cochrane review here, we found that it may improve a tension headache, but the chance of pain being relieved entirely is low, about two in 10 people, which is only slightly better than placebo. So while you can try paracetamol as first line, maybe you want to try it for the placebo effect. It has very poor evidence for treating tension type headache. NICE, which is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK, has very optimistic guidance and it says reassurance and symptomatic treatment is usually sufficient. Not so often in my experience, but reassurance is, is important. A lot of people with tension type headaches think they have brain tumours, so it is good to reassure them, to listen to their symptoms, tell them that you understand, and you can use the same medications we mentioned for migraine, for tension type headaches as well. So that's your one gram of paracetamol and your favorite non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. You can give ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenic, or aspirin. You need to warn these people about medication overuse headache because these people are the most likely to get it. So we need to keep them away from opioids, just like with migraines. And there's no role for triptans in acute tension type headaches. They don't work. And even triptans can give medication overuse headache as well. So we have to be careful with their usage. But trying to keep these people away from opioids really is key and warning them about medication overuse headache. Long-term management of tension type headache disorder. There are a lot of reviews out there. There's no evidence for giving an SSRI antidepressant. It is not a symptom of depression. There was a theory about 10 years ago that by carefully giving Botox to certain muscles around the scalp, it would stop them from spasming and causing the tension headache. Turned out to have no evidence at all. Homeopathy doesn't work, but we know that because homeopathy works for nothing. And while there is good evidence for beta blockers, propranolol, in migraine, there's no evidence for beta blockers in tension headache. There is some weak evidence that acupuncture can improve recurrent tension type headache. And some clinical areas in the UK do refer patients for uh, acupuncture. There is good evidence for amitriptyline and regular gentle exercise, a little bit of exercise every day. Now you probably recognize that amitriptyline and regular exercise is also quite effective for people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, chronic pain. So it is possible that these diseases are somehow interlinked. So you can start with someone on a low dose amitriptyline, 10 milligrams at night, and then titrate it up if uh, they're having recurrent tension type headaches, which are impacting it on their life. So let's imagine for your patient, you've looked for all of these things, you've got to point four, and you think maybe this is a more rare headache. I want to quickly talk about the less common causes of headache. And these are the TACs, the TACs, the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias.
These are unilateral headaches, one side, mostly focused around the eye, and they have lots of trigeminal nerve autonomic features. The patient has lots of tearing, watering of the eye. They have very red eyes, lots of conjunctival injection. Their nose on that side gets very stuffed. They might get a bit of uh, ptosis of the same eyelid and lots of swelling of the eye. And these patients are in extreme pain and they are very agitated. If you imagine your migraine sufferer or your tension type headache sufferer lying still, quiet in a dark room, they don't like noise, they don't wanna move around, Patients with a trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias can't, can't sit still. They pace around the room, screaming, clawing at their eye like this. They bang their head off things, trying to get the pain out. They're in a very bad way. So I always think about, if you're remembering the trigeminal headaches, think of the three A's. They are anterior headaches, usually focus around the eye. They are autonomic, so you get all these autonomic features of the trigeminal nerve and they are agitated patients. And the commonest type of trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia you may see is a cluster headache. Although there are a family of five headaches, and I'll talk briefly about cluster, sunct, and suna. I won't talk about uh, paroxysmal hemicrania and hemicrania continua because these do not really present acutely as an emergency. So a cluster headache. The thing about cluster headache is that the treatment is high flow oxygen. 15 liters of oxygen via a face mask is extraordinarily effective and no one really knows why. But uh, patients who have recurrent cluster headaches, if they are non-smokers, they can have oxygen at home because we know that it aborts the headache entirely. They're pain-free in 15 minutes in 70% of patients. So if you suspect someone has a trigeminal autonomic headache, they have a cluster headache, get the 15 liters of oxygen on, forget if they're hypoxic or what their oxygen levels are and see if that switches off the headache. The other option you've got is sumatriptan, which you can give as an intranasal spray or as a subcutaneous injection. It aborts the tack entirely in about 50% of cases and minimizes the pain, improves the pain level uh, in about 75% of patients. So these are the two options for cluster headache if you see them. There is no role for any kind of analgesia. You can give these patients 10 milligrams of morphine intravenously and they will still be in severe pain. So do not waste time giving um, paracetamol, NSAIDs, opiates to these patients at all. Again, another case where opiates are not useful. Here is the pain pattern for cluster headaches. So we saw migraine, we saw tension, cluster headaches. The patient is pain-free for days, weeks, months sometimes. And then they go through a period of about one to three weeks having acute clusters of pain, where the pain goes from nothing to extremely severe lasting for a few minutes and then it goes off again. And a single cluster headache can last between sort of a few minutes to up to an hour and a half, a maximum. And then it goes away and they get the next one afterwards. Sunct and Suna are sister headaches to cluster headache. And the reason they're considered separate to cluster headache is because they affect a different type of demographic and the pain response is different to different medications. They're both acronyms, which you can see here. SUNCT is short-lasting unilateral neuralgia form headache with conjunctival injection and tearing, and SUNA is short-lasting unilateral neuralgia form headache attacks with cranial autonomic symptoms. I include these because in my career, I've been a doctor now for 15 years, I have seen two cases of SUNCT in the emergency department. Um, so that I always tell other people because maybe you'll see one too. Whilst cluster headache usually affects young men in their 20s, SUNCT and SUNA affect men, older men in their 50s. The pain lasts for minutes at a time and nothing touches it. No painkiller. Oxygen, opioids, triptans, nothing makes the pain go away. Uh, and they require carbamazepine or other um, anti-epileptic drugs for long-term uh, prophylaxis. But the patient will say they're absolutely fine and all of a sudden they'll start screaming, clutching their eye, and their eye starts tearing and going red and they're in terrible pain. And for a few minutes later, they'll go, oh, it's gone. And the pain will stop. And then a few minutes later, it'll come back all of a sudden. Very, very distressing. If we compare cluster headaches with sunk side by side, we can see that uh, cluster headache is usually young guys, whereas sunk is older. Cluster headaches usually last between 15 minutes, 180 minutes, whereas sunk can only, usually only last for a few seconds, a few seconds of excruciating eye pain, and then it's gone. 
Um, cluster headache tends to happen uh, during the one to three times in a day. Some can happen about 28 times on, on again. Uh, cluster happens a lot at night, but some only happens when you're awake. And cluster headache responds to drugs, and some really does not. The only treatment that's been proven to be effective in some and sooner, as you can see here, is intravenous lidocaine infusions which most units, including mine, simply do not offer because intravenous lidocaine is a medication that requires very close monitoring on a cardiac monitor because it can precipitate arrhythmias. So if you do have someone who is coming in with symptoms in keeping with sumpt or SUNA, then you need to have an urgent conversation with your uh, tertiary center for neurology and say, could this patient be a candidate for intravenous lidocaine? Or there's some weaker evidence for a greater occipital nerve injection which is much more difficult to arrange but no other medication will unfortunately be effective so that's the end of my talk so hopefully you my take-home messages you'll agree are that opiates opioids have almost no role in headaches acute headaches at all the only time i'd ever give an opiate is if a migraine sufferer insists to me this is the one thing that works for them and it does or if a patient has had a sudden subarachnoid hemorrhage and is intense pain and requires neurosurgery. Otherwise, I never touch them. We always exclude secondary headaches first because we cannot make a diagnosis of primary headache disorder before we've done that. The Ottawa rule and the six hour CT head rule make the management of thunderclap headaches and possible subarachnoid bleeds more straightforward. And always be alert for the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias when you're assessing your patient with a headache because the treatment will be very, very different. And that's the end of the talk. So I'm gonna hand back now to my moderators to see if they have any questions for me. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Ben, for this wonderful and comprehensive presentation. And there was almost 100 uh, colleagues here listening to your presentation. And now we now invite all the online participants to ask their questions. You can ask your questions either directly here uh, by your microphones or you can use the chat box. Actually, we have uh, three or four questions. We have already questions. Um, and the first question is that uh, from Olivia. If you think someone has a migraine, would you still like to rule out an intracranial bleed by doing a CT LP before you let them go ECP if it's a very severe headache and it's the first presentation? Um, only if their migraine presented as a thunderclap headache, as a sudden onset headache. Remember, subarachnoid bleeds is a sudden arterial bleed. So if the headache came on like that, uh, even if I thought it was a migraine, maybe I'd use the pound criteria and I've diagnosed a migraine. A thunderclap headache always makes me pause and think whether or not I need to progress to the CT and the LP. I would get a CT scan for any thunderclap headache, even if a patient has a known history of migraines. Because just because you have migraines, you're still allowed to have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so I would use the CT. I'd use the Ottawa rule and the six hour CT rule to try and rule out uh, having to do a lumbar puncture for these patients. Okay, thank you. And the six, second question is that, uh, how often have you used aspirin 900 milligram in your experience? Quite a lot, I find it very useful. The thing about 900 milligrams of aspirin is that it frightens the nurses and it frightens the patients because it comes in 75 milligram tabs and they're counting out one, two, three, and they get to, I don't know how many tablets that is, but it's a little mountain of tablets. And the patient looks at it and thinks you're giving them an overdose. But as long as you've said it's a perfectly safe dose, I find 900 milligrams of aspirin really useful. So we have another question. How late on into a migraine would you give a triptan if the patient has had a chest pressure side effect from triptans but can tolerate it? Is it okay to, to continue or is that, is that an indication to stop the medicine? Uh, I would give a triptan at any point in a patient's migraine journey. I'd like to give it before the pain phase, but if I can't, I would still give it in the pain phase because it could still 
ameliorate the pain levels. It can still improve the pain levels. Uh, if a patient develops the side effects of chest pressure, but they did not have coronary artery disease, and they had no risk factors for um, coronary artery disease, then I would tell the patient, if you can tolerate the chest pressure, then I would take the triptan because uh, it is a common side effect. It will not do any harm and it may improve your migraine. Okay. Uh, then the next question, uh, question, are there any uncommon presentation of subarachnoidal hemorrhage that can look like a tension headache that we should worry about? No, subarachnoid hemorrhage has to present with a thunderclap headache. There is simply no, if you've got a tension headache and it came on as a thunderclap headache, then I would be thinking about subarachnoid hemorrhage before I made the diagnosis. That's why in the sequence of events, I always said rule out serious secondary causes before you ever get to making a diagnosis of primary headache disorder. So I'd always take the thunderclap nature, the sudden onset nature, um, uh, very seriously before I then said, okay, this is a tension headache. That subarachnoid hemorrhages, they can present quite dramatically with um, uh, decreased conscious level, with impaired neurology, such as hemiparesis or dysphasia. But most of the time they present with su simply pain, really bad pain, often with meningism and photophobia because it irritated their meningeal uh, lining. Um, but I would never get to a diagnosis of tension headache in a thunderclap until I've ruled out subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, thank you. Another question from Rafaela Mana. What about biologic treatment against porcalcitonin receptor? So this is something which is at the cutting edge of tertiary neurology, and it's certainly nothing that I would use in my daily practice as an internist. Uh, I know that they exist, but I've never used them in practice, so I wouldn't be able to give you any good advice about them. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, <clears throat> yeah. um, is there any way to prevent migraines? I get the question quite often from migraine patients undergoing surgery and worried that they will wake, uh, they will wake with a migraine. That's a good question. Any change in a patient's sleeping pattern can trigger a migraine. Uh, and if they were having a general anesthetic or they were taking analgesia, uh, or maybe they're nauseated post-op and they're not eating properly. All of those things can trigger a migraine. And it's certainly something to consider if a patient who suffers from migraines is considering surgery. I guess the best thing you can do as their physician is to make sure that their migraines are as better controlled as you can by making sure they're established on the propranolol or the topiramate or whatever drug you have chosen before they go for a big event such as surgery, which is going to upset their normal balance. And often people with migraines once they've done some research and some trial and error, they can work out what their own triggers are as well. Uh, and they can do the, their own things, such as avoiding certain things in their diet or avoid, avoiding um, changes in their biorhythms. But um, if they have to have surgery, then yes, they'll have to prepare themselves for a migraine. So I would just get them as established as I can on a prophylactic treatment before the surgery. Good answer. Uh, next, uh, what are your next options in case of ineffectiveness, ineffectiveness of triptans? So if someone is, is a non-responder to triptans, then unfortunately the only option they've got are the non-specific treatments uh, for an acute attack, which are your NSAID paracetamol, um, which may have varying attacks. And these people are very unfortunate. What we need to do for them is make sure that we have established them on the proper prophylactic treatment so that their acute flare-ups um, are as minimized as possible. If someone can't take triptans, some thera a therapy which could work is a greater occipital nerve uh, block, which is lidocaine to the occipital nerve, which has got some really good uh, outcome data for people who don't respond well to medication. But of course, this would be a referral to a neurology service. And, and another question with triptans, about triptans. If they do develop chest pressure, et cetera, do you still go ahead and do an ECG and drops or put it down as a side effect of triptans? This always leaves me wondering, but to be fair, I'm still fairly new to practicing acute medicine. Um, it depends on the patient. If the patient was a, a bit older, they were in their 50s and maybe they've got a risk factor for coronary artery disease, if they got chest pressure, I might do an ECG and a trop. But most patients I've seen who are taking triptans are young women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And if they say, 
I take the triptan and I get chest pressure. It's chest pressure. It's very predictable. Um, and then it wears off as the migraine wears off. I'm happy to leave it at that and say this is unlikely to be a cardiac event if it clearly relates to the triptans. And the last question is that in first presentation of migraines, do you organize neuroimaging or follow up MRI? That's a great question. The answer is yes. Very, very rarely migraines can be mimicked by other disorders such as an arteriovenous malformation. Um, and I would make sure there were no structural changes to the brain. So I would organize a non-urgent outpatient MRI of the brain for people I've made a new diagnosis of migraine in. Okay, so I think the time is up. Uh, we have one more question, Ben, if you are willing. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have any tips to diagnose or suspect sentinel headaches? And if you do suspect them, what can you do? So sentinel headaches, uh, which is a headache which leads up to a subarachnoid hemorrhage, are quite controversial within the world of headaches because a lot of people think there's no such thing as a sentinel bleed. That sentinel bleed is your subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and it can get quite tricky. I, for me, if someone comes in with a good history of a sentinel headache, and by that I mean they had a thunderclap headache, which then completely went away again. Often this is a coital headache. So on or just after orgasm, they get this exploding headache and then it settles and goes away. This could be a tiny sentinel bleed. Uh, and, and this is the kind of patient I do actually think about getting the urgent six hour CT and uh, the lumbar puncture for to rule out the little bleed, to rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is a role for patients who have sentinel headaches for instead getting uh, CT angiography to look for aneurysms, but this is not, um, it's not as reliable for knowing who is going to have a big subarachnoid bleed in the future because some subarachnoid bleeds do not come from aneurysms. Um, and a lot of people, about 10 to 15% of us do have aneurysms and we don't have a subarachnoid bleeds. So doing CT angiography is often putting the patient at risk of more investigations because we find they have some incidental aneurysms and the next thing they know they're being listed for neurosurgery and coiling and they didn't have any bleeding. So I'm not a big fan of CT angiograms. But if someone has a sentinel headache, which goes away completely, for me, I treat that as a thunderclap headache and I start applying the Ottawa rule, the six hour CT rule and thinking about a lumbar puncture. Okay. And we have more questions coming in. Um, we just have to say, Ben, if you're willing to continue or if you yes. have had enough. Yeah, we can do a couple. Okay. Do a couple of more. Uh, thank you for such a nice lecture, says Katharina Clausens. Would you recommend to make a TMJ x-ray for a diagnosis of temporal mandible joint dysfunction if it is not felt on touch, but patient complains of migraine and teeth grinding? Um, in the UK, if I thought a patient had a TMJ dysfunction, they had very tender, what have you, I would refer them to a dentist. I could order an x-ray of the TMJ, but I'm completely not skilled to read it and interpret it. So I wouldn't do it. I refer them to dentistry. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, but before we finish this session, uh, I would like to point out a survey that we're carrying out within Young Internists of EFIN to evaluate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, that has had on us as medical doctors across Europe. Uh, we would be grateful if you could spare 10 to 15 minutes to complete the survey. You can find the link on our Facebook site and I'll also put it on the chat. Um, yeah, so Ben, thank you very much for an excellent lecture. It was really good. You're welcome. I hope it was useful. And to all our participants, thank you. Good evening. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.